you record it, so uh, you kind of have to follow through on that. I know. <laughs> right? Got it just in time. What else can we ask Karen for? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this morning is uh, Dan and Angie talking about sort of seed economics from different perspectives, values of seeds. And then we have kind of a rundown of where does all that seed go in the second hour? Is that what we're up to? Just, I'm just refreshing my brain. Yeah. And don't worry. I also have an agenda slide because my brain needs that too. <laughs> I, I definitely got in here. It's like, what are we doing today? <laughs> Make sure it's good. <laughs> It'd be great. It'd be great. If it gets bad, I'll just pull up that video of the mites I was telling you about, Herod, and we'll just watch the mites doing oh, the full slap fight. Please don't. <laughs> no one's going to join the seed course after that. Right? Yeah. I'll just have to make it real clear. It's not my garlic. That was the, I, I sent that video to so many people, <laughs> including somebody had, who had just eaten a bunch of my garlic. They're like, oh my God, is that on your garlic? Like, no. Not that you have noted. No, not that I'm going to stick it under a microscope either. <laughs> All right. I'm going to start letting people in. Okay. Yeah, my brain is definitely in that special space that it gets into when I've done a lot of meetings because... I was just thinking about screen sharing versus screen oversharing. Look at that, 28 participants. We're here early, good. Yeah. Sorry, I muted it, but. Hello, everybody. Welcome or welcome back, depending on if this is your first day of seed conference stuff. people are a little bit more on time today. So we'll give it another minute or so. Let folks continue to grab their coffees and get seated and enter the conference. I hope everybody is somewhere warm and cozy, or at least has enough blankets to keep yourselves warm. Oh, hello, go back there. Morning, Tina. Morning. Morning, everyone. Morning. Hey, Angie. Good morning. All right. The gang's all here. Well, we'll let people continue to slide in as they do. 
And I will go ahead and welcome everybody to the third session of our seed production intensive for market farmers. Uh, my name is Crystal Stewart Cortens. I will be facilitating today's workshop, um, and I'm really excited to introduce the topics for today. But before we do that, for folks that are joining us for the first time today, I just want to let you know a little bit more about um, the sessions that are being provided today. Um, these are part of what we're calling a seed production intensive. They are the introduction to a larger grant, which is called Increasing Capacity to Produce High Quality Regionally Adapted Seed to Enhance Northeast Biosecurity and Diversify Markets. And that grant is supported through um, Northeast SARE. Uh, this is the kickoff of that project, and we will be continuing into a seven week long online course after this. So for those of you that are already involved in the course, welcome. For those of you that are interested in signing up for the course, um, it's actually filled for this year, but this is a two year project. So we are currently collecting a group of interested folks for next year. Um, at some point, we will drop the enrollment form for the project into the chat box. And if you haven't already signed up and would like to be on the wait list, we'll continue to communicate with you throughout the year. And then you'll be able to sign up for that online course um, next winter and go through the project then. So do not despair if you haven't made it into the larger project. Um, there's still room and there's still time. So what we're doing this morning, um, this is one of two sessions today, second one's this afternoon, um, and this morning is, is really going to take a deep dive into the value of seed and the seed shed. So this morning we'll spend an hour talking about um, two different aspects of seed value. Dan Brisbois is going to speak to us about seed economics. I'll tell you what the fee is. And as you come in, just remember to mute yourselves. Um, so Dan Brisbois is, is going to discuss seed economics and dig into the numbers a bit with us, which is pretty exciting. And then Angela is going to talk to us about community agriculture and the value of seed as an integral part of community and culture. And um, we'll have about 20 minutes of Q&A at the end of that session. So there'll be lots of time for discussion and, and sharing within that. Um, we'll then take a very quick break and we will explore the seed shed. Um, seed shed being a term that I believe was coined by Kay Green and it's analogous to the watershed. So thinking about the many tributaries that, that bring seed into a system and then the various places that seed flows into within that system. And we'll, we'll break that down. Our, our tributaries that we're discussing today are um, community seed use. And we'll hear from Natasha Field uh, about seed swaps and seed libraries, um, in-person community seed use um, from Tina Square and Angela Ferguson, and then um, a few different market channels. We'll talk about direct seed sales from the farm, which is something that Dan's been doing, um, wholesaling seed from Amira Mitchell and Heron Breen, and then on-farm seed use also from Heron. And for folks that are joining us for the first time today, I will ask that all of our speakers, once again, just give a really brief introduction um, of who you are so that folks can get to know everybody. Um, and many of the, the folks that are speaking today are also mentors in the program. So we'll see them again in the afternoon as people are getting to know other people that are in the program and uh, learning more about what we're doing uh, during the seven week seed course. So I can go ahead and stop sharing. And I will hand it off to you, Dan, to dig into the numbers with us. Well, thank you. Um, I will start sharing. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I'm shared. So um, I've entitled this presentation, The Economics of Growing Seed, some quick benchmarks to evaluate profit potential. and. Uh, before we talk a lot about money, and I, I will introduce myself in a moment, but before we talk a lot about money and seeds, I wanna start with a poem. And so just as a heads up on the left is a kohlrabi flower and Brassica oleraceae is the species that kohlrabi is. So K is for oleraceae, holding up its arms like a salute to spring, rattling flies and bees and bugs, anticipation for buds about to open, I'm thinking about the seeds. And I, I just wanna mention this, like 
the last line, I think about the seeds, even though we're talking a lot about money, this is this, the seeds is what's, what's important in all this. But um, that being said, I have another poem, which is N is for exactly what you're left with after you take out everything you've spent. It's easy to ignore costs and look at big numbers and say, wowee, can you ever make a lot off of one acre, oblivious to everything it takes to get there? Mind you, the numbers can pencil out as long as you estimate with wisdom and not just conviction. So we'll also be talking about money. And I bring this forward, this is N is for net income, and it's an important part, um, which is, and we're gonna get into it a little bit, but I'll be talking not so much about net income. I'll be talking about the gross sales predominantly. And um, yeah, and there's poetry in all the things that we live in. So um, uh, this is me, I'm Dan Brisbois. I'm part of Turnisol Cooperative Farm. Um, we have been in operation for almost 20 years. We started off as five people who met studying uh, agriculture at McGill, at McGill University. And we started a worker co-op together. At this point, our worker co-op has grown to nine members and we're about 20 people total in the business. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we're situated west of Montreal in Les Cedres, Quebec, about 45 minutes west of Montreal, if there's no traffic. And we are also vegetable growers and we grow vegetables for a 500 member weekly uh, CSA. And, mm -hmm. um, and then we grow seeds for, um, at this point it's predominantly retail. And so I'm going to just do a quick outline of what our seed company looks like, uh, just to put in context of who I am. So in 2005, our first growing year, we sold $600 of seed through two seed contracts to, to or to three seed contracts to two seed companies. The next year, we sold more seed to the same companies, and we also started our first seed catalog, which is a PDF with 20 varieties. Um, in 2012, we were selling seed to about 10 different companies on contract or stuff that we were growing on speculation for them. And we had an online seed store that had about 200 varieties or so. At this point, um, we're predominantly selling everything through an online store and we have a very large seed rack program. We're in over 150 stores across Quebec mostly. And we have about 510 people growing seeds specifically for us in addition to what we grow ourselves, even though we still grow maybe about 60% of what we sell. And, uh, and we still sell a bit of seed to other few companies, but it's not a large part of the operation. So that's just kind of the, the different, um, I guess, evolution. And um, I'm also the host of the Seed Growers podcast. Uh, um, there was 10 episode season last year. We interviewed different seed growers and there's another one coming up. It's gonna be great. <laughs> um, and so today with the economics of growing seeds, um, I'm gonna talk about what an accurate profit analysis is and why I'm not gonna push doing one. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about some benchmarks. So benchmarks are on growing space, so dollars per bed foot. We're gonna look a lot at yields and price per pound. And then we're gonna talk about harvest and post-harvest time benchmarks. And I'll get a little bit more into those benchmarks uh, shortly, but I'll start with the accurate profit analysis. So if you're really doing a real profit analysis, you take all your sales, and you subtract all your expenses and you have to make sure your labor is valued in there and all the labor that, 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 that that's working in that. And at the end, you have profit and or loss, but we hope it's profit. And with that, you can evaluate different crops um, uh, based on that. Now, this is, gives you a really precise idea of your finances and profitability. It's definitely a fantastic tool. It requires detailed record keeping of a lot of different things, including especially the labor, because usually one of the biggest expenses is the labor. So that, that's, that's a big one to re do record keeping. It also requires a lot, allocating a lot of expenses that might be kind of general into specific categories. So stuff like potting soil or bed prep, cover crops, all kinds of things. And so if you really want to be precise, you have to have ways to do that. Um, and, and so this is really valuable work, but I know from working with a lot of farmers that most farmers are, not, I'm not gonna say most farmers, but there's a lot of farmers that are not inclined to do this work and would just rather do something else. And so I think it's important to be realistic about that. And that's kind of the approach I'm gonna take with this of looking at some benchmarks rather than going deep into numbers of all the numbers, going to numbers I think are important. Um, and so the two benchmarks I'm gonna be looking at are the growing space benchmark. So how much space does it take in your garden? And I'm gonna look at that in terms of dollars per bed foot. And then how much time it takes to harvest and post-harvest. And sometimes I might just call it harvest time, but I'm always including the post-harvest in there. And it's often, I, I, I do similar math with vegetables um, where post-harvest isn't as important, but with seeds, post-harvest is even more important than the harvest. Um, but whenever I just say har harvest per hour, I, I, I do mean the post-harvest in there. And so I think that these two benchmarks really give you a good idea of a profitability of a crop. And 
so I guess in, in my experience, th these benchmarks, they really correlate with, with profitability on smaller farms. So we're talking like, you know, zero to 10 acres, you know, sub acre farms that like up to 10 acres. And these are farms where um, there's a lot of efficiencies to be gained uh, in all kinds of places and labor is a really big piece of it. Um, but you're also often having fairly high valuable crops. And so these met metrics, I've really, like farms that I see that go really deep into the numbers, most of them, the profitable crops in terms of these benchmarks are also the profitable crops that a crop budget will show. Now, the larger your farm, the less you should rely on these benchmarks as the only thing you're looking at. Um, the bigger your farm, um, that's when, that's when a, a, an actual profit analysis can really be valuable. So it's just a little caveat. So in terms of growing space benchmark, um, you know, the math is simple. You have your price in dollars per pound times your yield, which would be pounds per bed foot. Um, and a bed foot is, so if you have a full bed, um, a, a one foot slice of that bed is a bed foot. And so like it might, let's say you're growing lettuce on three rows, um, then you're, and you had three, one head per bed, one one head per per row in the row. At that bed foot would have three lettuces in it. Just kind of visualize that. So your price times your yield gives you your dollars per bed foot. And then there's also the harvest time benchmark I'm about to look into. And this is you know the the pounds that you've harvested or or processed times the price divided by the total hours gives you a dollars per per hour. And that's the harvest and post harvest again. Now, um. This is important, the time, but I'm gonna encourage you to not worry too much about time if you're a new seed grower. Um, there is so much technique and expertise that goes into it that if you don't totally know what you're doing, it's probably gonna take way more time than it could, and you definitely can learn more. So you're gonna get dramatically faster as you gain experience um, and you develop techniques. In some cases, it's also about having the right tool, but I think people often give too much uh, credit to what a tool can do. And often the experience and the technique is more important than the tool. And if you've mastered, if you have good experience and good techniques, then the tool can really optimize you. So just don't focus too much on the time, even though I'm going to talk about it here. So um, I, there's a spreadsheet I'm going to jump into. You can go to a landing page that has it. There's an e email sign up place. You don't have to sign up for the email. If you go underneath, you can just click on it and you'll get to the, the spreadsheet that I'm going to share. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing this and then go into into the spreadsheet, assuming I have it open. Yes, I do. Okay, and I'll make this a little bit bigger. So um, this sheet has a few different things in it. One, so one is a tab called secrets. It's just a few, if you're curious about some of the formulas in here, I've written different articles or spreadsheet tips about some of them. Some of these are videos. Some of them are early in my, my career doing this and the quality is not that fantastic but the content is amazing. <laughs> so just be, be a judge, but don't judge too harshly. So the first, so the sections divided in colored tabs. So the first section is, um, is, uh, is yields. These are sample yields based on my experience and based on what I've done, seen through reading. Um, they're, they're not a substitute for your own yields, but they're a really good starting point if you don't have them. And I have kind of a low yield and a high yield estimate. And then what that, this is 100 per, pounds per 100 foot bed foot, what it comes down to ounces in bed foot or grams per bed foot, depending what units you like to work with. So that's that's the first thing. So just data that you can use for your own fun. Um, the next section is prices. And these are some sample prices that, uh, uh, that Nikos from uh, Fedco uh, shared with me uh, in a kind of a workshop context in 2017. And um, these these numbers are probably out of date. And so they're just there as kind of a starting point, you know, and having real, like if you're dealing with a real seed company as a contract, they can, they can give you numbers, but it's just somewhere to start to have some of that, that math. Um, the next section, um, uh, well, one thing is there's a place where you can write in how you're with your beds because that's gonna affect the math. Um, there's a, a page called crop summary which I am actually, it's, I'm gonna expand it. I'm gonna come back to this in a moment. I'm gonna explain some other things first and then come back and apply it, he, what that is. But this is the, the real life part where you're gonna put your numbers in if you want. Um, so I'll jump now into, there's a section of tabs, step one through four related to growing space. And so let's say, how much do you wanna sell this year? And so let's say we wanna sell $150,000. 
of crop. And not necessarily seed, this is all things coming off of your farm. And then here you can run through how much growing space you have. Again, you can write your way, how wide your beds are, how long your beds are. And there's some stuff if you wanna double crop your beds because that has a bit of an impact on it. Um, I'm not gonna drill down into this, but you, you can fill it out. In, in this example, uh, there's like some greenhouse and some, some outdoor beds. And what it comes down to with the math is you need to average $50,000 per acre if you wanna hit your sales target off of this space. And there's another page here that kind of shows what some of that means. So a $50,000 an acre is the same as about $5.74 of bed foot. And then I have different ratings based on the ratio, you know, so if you make 70% of that, it's not as hot, but it's not the end of the world, you know, going down to, you know, you're probably losing money on the lower end and then stuff that's very profitable. And I'm going to kind of go back. I think these numbers were balanced a little bit around the hundred thou mark. I'm not totally sure, but I'm just going to, so in this case here, if you're making 33 thou, um, that's 379 a bed foot. And something important to know is this, this is each crop that you have. So if you were to grow two crops, one after the other, and you make $4 a bed foot for each of them, that's going to just be more value out of, or, or more profit or out, of, out of that area. Um, so this is a first set of sheets to kind of look at what your dollars per bed foot benchmark is. And it's, it's really a function of how much do you want to sell this year divided by your total acreage. And if you're just thinking of cropping once and you have two acres, then if you do 100,000 divided by two acres, that's 50,000 an acre, that's easy. This intermediate step is really if you're multiple, cropping multiple times. So that's the first benchmark that we're going to kind of look at. Um, the second is the harvest time um, and, and post-harvest time in there. And so here, you're, let's say you're making $100,000 or you wanna make $100,000, you can estimate how many harvest hours that you have in this. And this is something that you can do with different levels of, degree, of, of, of precision. In this case, I just assume, you know, it's two people that are harvesting for 25 hours a week for 25 weeks, it's 1,250 hours. If, that, if they wanna make this much money and they have this much harvest and post-harvest time, then they need to be making $80 an hour um, with each of those harvest and post-harvest hours. And now some things are going to be higher, some things are going to be lower. You probably should be aiming higher. I would say $120 an hour is definitely safe on this. A ballpark figure, or not a, I don't figure is the right word, but um, a number you can think of is you can multiply by five or six the amount that you're paying one of your employees to kind of have a number for this also, often in a smaller market garden context. So if you're paying somebody $15 an hour and they're harvesting somewhere between 90 and $105 an hour, is that right? Does that the math work? <laughs> Not 15 times five would be $75 an hour. Um, am I right on that? Yeah. Anyway, that's a benchmark you can you can work with. Let's not question the exact math I'm, I'm doing there. But here, this sheet kind of shows if you have different crops the price per pound, and then theoretically, how many pounds per hour you would need to hit that target, you know? And um, if you're trying to do this many pounds of that crop, how many hours it should do. Now, this is a very math-based way of doing it. And so these are kind of ways that you could compare. Um, but now I'm gonna jump into more like real numbers and how they feed into that. So I'm gonna go back to the crop summary. And here's a sheet where there's three crops. And, you know, if I'm dealing, working with vegetables, I, I would probably just say, you know, tomato or beans. I wouldn't worry about the variety so much. When you're working with seeds, the variety makes a lot, it makes a big difference. The plants grow differently. The yields are different. Um, and so I think you should be keeping tracking of those, those yields and times, especially the yields and function of the variety, not just the crop. So the, this column here is uh, B is how many bed feet were planted. So 200 of Yukina Savoy, uh, 50 of uh, Jaune Flamme tomato and 300 feet of, of uh, fighter beans. And then here's a price per pound um, that I put down for those. Now, there are two other sheets that are feeding into this. One is a cleaning log. So this is a sheet where there's a drop down menu where you can choose any crop that's listed in this first section. And then um, you could write, you know, how many pounds were harvested or cleaned uh, and what day you actually did the kind of final cleaning. And so this often, one thing that's different with seed versus veg is that veg, if you go out and you harvest 300 lettuce heads, you know you harvested 300 lettuce heads pretty immediately. And it's easy to do record keeping with that immediately. Whereas if you grow and you harvest uh, um, a brassica, you like, and it's still in the plants, 
um, or it's still in the pods. Um, until you get break it down to being actual, mostly clean seed, you're not gonna have an idea what the weight is. So there's a delay in that. So here's a, a log where you can record the actual weight harvested. And then here's a sheet I put together with the actual tasks that might be happening over the season. And maybe I'll just sort these to kind of, you know, so there's a brassica, there's a, there's a you can a savoy harvest happens one week um, and then another one a bit later and then you're harvesting your tomatoes squishing them fermenting decanting them and then harvesting another batch and the time in hours that it would take um, actually this pound's harvested we're going to delete that that that's not necessary here but here's the the, the time that it takes and um, uh, and so this you would track the stuff that you're doing or at least a sample of it so that you have a rate that you can work with later. And back on the crop summary, there's a sum if formula that says the total pounds harvested and the total time harvested. And so those are there. And then there's some metrics on the far right. So the pounds per bed foot, um, uh, and then that's converted into ounces or grams per bed foot in yield. So you can see there's different, there's different amount that you can get per plant, which is, which is normal. Um, but it's really the price that has an impact on the dollars per bed foot here. So you can see even though there's more yield or more weight coming out of a bed foot of you can a Savoy, it's still less dollars per bed foot than tomatoes because that price is a valuable piece of it. And so there's the dollar per bed foot and then also how that com converts to a dollars per acre. And that dollars per acre is where you can compare a bit with that metric we looked at before. So if we're trying to make $33,000 an acre, then the you can a Savoy is definitely passing that. The tomato is phenomenal compared to it. And then there's the, um, the uh, the the bean which is underneath it, um, and now um, these numbers have an, are impacted by the yield. So if you have a bad year and you have a low yield, that's going to go down, and you don't necessarily know beforehand. Or if you have a better year, better techniques. If you're able to get a um, hundred pounds, I'll just override that here. A hundred pounds, you can make th you make thirty five thousand dollars almost. Whereas if you're making if you're harvesting forty pounds out of the same area, you're down to thirteen thousand. So the yield has an impact. But then so does the price. If you could get $20 a pound, then that brings you up to closer to the amount that the Yukina Savoy was at. And, and that price really makes a difference. And if depending who you're selling to, um, the price is different places, depending on the variety. If you have, if you're harvesting a bean-like provider, which is something that's fairly available out there on the wholesale market, and it's a bush bean, so it's easy to mechanize. So there are places that are possibly growing it mechanized. So seed comp you might be con you're competing with with that in that context. You might have a lower price per pound. If you're growing a pole bean, um, then you might have a much higher price per pound as a consequence because there's more work into it. But there's also maybe less availability of that seed. Um, if you're dealing with a seed company that really values bioregional seed, they may be willing to pay you more for a common variety just because they want it grown by a local variety. So those are all things that will have an impact on this. And then the dollar per processing hour, again, that's the, um, you know, that's the, the, the price divided by the time. Um, and actually there's one col more column I'm gonna add, or maybe I'm gonna add it right here, is um, there's also the total value. Uh, let me just do that. Does that make sense? No, it's not. Sorry. Live spreadsheets. Okay. So um, uh, I'll get back to that in a second. But yeah, so there's the, the dollars per processing hour, which is similar math based on the time. And this is something that, you know, if you are new to seed saving and it takes you twice as much, it's going to take you a lot less time to save seed. And this is one thing where if you're doing a lot of small lots, it can be a lot of work to be switching from one thing to another. Whereas if you're doing a larger lot, sometimes that's where uh, you can have an economy of, I guess, of scale that, that comes in. And, and then the last thing here is, is, is the total value um, is an important thing to think about because, um, so if you look at these numbers, um, something like the tomatoes is really exciting the dollars per acre. The processing is not so bad, probably can be improved with a bit of efficiency in the harvest time. Um, but there's only so many pounds of tomato that somebody might buy from you. Whereas with the with with the beans, you know, there might be somebody who might want to buy 200 or 300 pounds of beans. So there's maybe a higher potential um, in there. So something to think about when you're balancing with these metrics is: Are you making enough to be able to make a living off of it? 
Um, I am going to separate away from the spreadsheets and kind of get back to the presentation or kind of wrap up a bit. Are there any questions about the spreadsheet specifically that um, uh, somebody, just look at the. Yeah, uh, Liz was just asking, um, if you're tracking time for planting, cultivation, et cetera, for each of your seed crops, in addition to tracking harvest and post-harvest time. So this kind of goes back to what I was saying at the beginning, is if you really want to have an actual profit analysis, you should. And the more detail you have, the better. However, what I think is usually the biggest bottleneck with the crop, um, be it seed or vegetables or flowers, is the harvest time. Maybe the weeding is being important too, but the harvest time. So that's more what I'm paying attention to. And the metrics that I have, those 10, those time benchmarks are really in function of just evaluating the harvest time, not the whole thing. Um, and often for a crop, for a lot of crops, you know, the time to establish and get it going are somewhat comparable one to the other. I mean, something like tomatoes, maybe there's staking involved that adds a bit more, um, or maybe you have some potting up in, 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 a, in a nursery. But a lot of the establishment spot costs are similar. Um, and it's really the harvest that you can really evaluate between different crops. So that, that's where I'm coming from on that. All right, there's no other questions, I think. So I'm gonna go back to the slides. And then we can also have questions afterwards. All right. Um, so kind of we just got through some spreadsheets, looked at some benchmarks. Um, I just had a th more, few more thoughts about like, I'm calling it true profit because the profit is the money is a profit, but there's other reasons to grow seed on your farm. You know, you want to adapt crops to your soil, your climate and your growing practices with a, with a C, not a V. Um, you want you know, you're able to provide more control over seed quality. You know, you know, if there's a germination issue, you know where it's it's from. You're able to do better things to increase your germination. You have more control over diseases. Um, you, can have an, you can ensure a reliable and resilient supply of seeds. And sometimes that's very valuable when certain crops are, are, are not available. I know a few years ago, there was a big shortage of kale. And so it's a variety that you really liked having your own supply meant that you didn't care there was a worldwide shortage of that or if, you know a, a continent-wide sh shortage of kale seed. So it really helps that in the short term. And over the long term, this is what keeps varieties available is when people have relationships with them. So growing seed in your farm also puts you in a deep, deeper relationship with your own crops um, and a deep relationship with all the past seed keepers who've you know, brought the, blessed us with those crops that we have today. And it puts a relationship with the future seed keepers and farmers and eaters. So this is the other part that the numbers doesn't capture that is why it is worth bringing seed on your farm. So um, just kind of wrapping up the presentation, what do you do next? So you make a list of the crops, varieties you want to grow to seed. You estimate their expected yield and really on a variety level, if you can, you estimate the price per pound you might get, or if you have an actual one, you have that. You know, do a little math of price times yield gives you a dollar per bed foot. You can kind of evaluate if that's good. You got to be aware if you're new to seed growing, be very careful how seriously you take these numbers because your scale is going to really improve over time. This might also mean start small. Don't invest too big in the space so that you don't feel you're burning yourself out. You really don't, you don't want to get hung up on these as you're starting your seed journey, but these are important things to keep you on the seed journey. If, if you're running a, 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 you know, a, a, a commercial farm. If you want more resources, um, all that spreadsheet stuff, you know, I, on my blog, I have spreadsheet things. I do have an online course about crop planting, including seeds. Um, that's a separate thing that goes in more in depth of what we looked at today. I've already mentioned the Seed Growers Podcast. It's fantastic. And I have a list of different seed grower resources at seedgrowers.farm. And there's some recorded workshops, some seed spreadsheets, some seed saving articles, all that kind of stuff. And if you go there, you're, um, you are you can see that list. Um, so just kind of to wrap up, you know, good seed economics makes a farm more sustainable, but good seed economics takes good seed stewardship and good seed skills. And this doesn't happen overnight. So it's okay to start small, you observe, you practice, you build relationships with the crops that you're growing, and you should go and grow some seed. So thank you. And I could do questions, or I don't know if we want to move into Angela right away. I'm not sure. I'll let, I'll let that to you, Crystal. I think I think that the two presentations are distinct enough that it might be good to do questions now if folks have a few. Uh, and then let folks digest 
Um, I was receiving some direct messages from people who were made extremely happy by the spreadsheets and are probably poking around at them right now. Um, but that might take a minute of digestion before people can actually formulate questions. So if, if there are any immediate questions, let's take them. And if there aren't yet, we'll pause after Angela speaks and then go back to questions. So let's see, uh, a couple questions just popped up. Um, Renee says, I'm curious to hear what seeds Dan has found to be the most or least profitable. Oh, and you're muted. <laughs> so I think that uh, tomatoes and peppers have often been some of the most profitable seeds for us. Um, and we, we do large lots, so it really, and, and we're good at, at transitioning. I think the most um, brassicas um, with many varieties have been fairly profitable for us. Um, I think the crops that we've had the, the hardest time make work for us uh, would be beans and peas. And um, some of it is the yield can be variable. We've, we haven't had consistent yields with peas. Sometimes we have bad yields, but it's also kind of the price per pound that, that comes in that really makes a difference. And even on our farm. So we, we grow seed predominantly for ourselves to put into packs and sell elsewhere. But when we're doing a profit analysis, we kind of, it's like we're selling the seed internally to ourselves. So we evaluate it at the same price that we'd contract it out to somebody else. And those are the crops that I can see are not where our biggest internal money makers are. Um, and uh, even though we might be putting uh, a significant amount of money, like there may be two or three more dollars of seed in a pack of beans than we are in a pea in, in tomatoes, the tomatoes are still more profitable in the field for us. Um, cucurbits is something that can really, the yield makes all the difference. You know, that's one that, and, and the variety and the year make a really big difference. So those are some thoughts about it. Um, and, and last thing is flowers can be very high yield if you can harvest them or process them when it's not too finicky. Uh, and then you also have to have the market for it. That, that's a really important one is you can grow anything you want, but if you don't have the market, then it's, you're not gonna make a profit off of it unless you really like a lot of seeds. That's helpful. Thank you. And actually both of the questions were almost identical about profitability. Yeah, that's great. So I'm gonna let people continue to percolate a little bit. That was, that was the fire hose of information, which is amazing and takes a second. So we'll let folks um, continue to think about this, and we'll go ahead and pivot to Angela to talk about community seed use, and then we'll take questions just for Angela, and then questions for the group as well. And I can't see Angela, actually. Are you there? Here. there you are. Perfect. Okay, you'd like me to begin? If you please. Okay. So hello everyone, I'm Angela Ferguson. Uh, I'm from the Onondaga Nation, I'm Eel Clan, and I am the supervisor of the Onondaga Nation farm. And I have a completely uh, different perspective to offer, which is uh, coming from an indigenous point of view, a Haudenosaunee point of view, of seeds, community use, and I apologize that I have a little bit of a cold, so not COVID, thank goodness. <laughs> but the kids uh, are all home today, so I hope I don't have any interruptions. Um, I was just thinking before this presentation started, I had to run outside and grab some firewood and pine cones were jumping off of the pine tree because it's so cold out. <sighs> They're so cold, they're just jumping off the tree. So there's like seeds all around us, you know, and they're shivering. The pine cones are even shivering. That's how cold it is. So I'm sure uh, everyone up here in the Northeast is bundled up today. So I want to begin by saying that our perspective here on the Onondaga Nation Farm is everything that we're doing is for our community. All of our seeds belong to the community and all of the food belongs to the community. So we're returning to an ancestral idea, which is 
all of our work that we do is communal, meaning that nobody is doing, not one person is doing the work, doing it together as a collective. And everything that we reap, the reward out of that harvest is returned to the people. So our economy is based on the food that the people receive. And the profit comes back in the health, the wellness, the spirituality, and the continuation of the um, health and wellness of our people. And it also um, keeps us connected to our ancestral ways. So it's a different thought process uh, with the same amount of work. And if you think about it, I love what Dan had to say, like, you know, there's so much investment that you have to like consider that what the what the workers are putting into the field. So the community invests in us. And so in all actuality, they've already paid for the food. So um, even when it I apologize, I don't know how to shut my telephone off. And sometimes people call me even when I tell them not to during the presentations. <laughs> I don't have a computer, so I have to do this by telephone. Um, but I wanna give you a little bit of history about the farm and how it came to be. Because um, for any of the indigenous people on this track, I would like to see all six nations have something uh, similar to what we have here. It's a return to our ancestral ways. And it's something that we've always done historically is had communal plantings. Um, if you look in the historical records and even the, the like if you go to Ganond again and you see uh, the layout that they have of the village, you know, prior to what it looks like now, uh, prior to contact, there were, you know, tens of thousands of acres of corn being planted. So obviously one person did not do that. The entire community, and as a matter of fact, the whole Confederacy used to travel to help different communities plant. So the history of the farm is that um, one of our chiefs here had the idea to continue planting for elders. And his name was Virgil Thomas. Uh, he's no longer with us. He wanted to have gardens planted for uh, our community elders that couldn't do that anymore. And so I originally started uh, working for him, planting for the elders and distributing the, the food to them and going house to house. And so by doing that, I not only developed a strong relationship with the land and the plants, but with the people by distributing the food. So they would be so pleased to have a visitor that sometimes I didn't get to many houses in a day because I would sit and listen to their stories and they would share their stories of how they planted and what seeds their family carried and what kind of corns and different things they grew. So I was able to have this collective of knowledge from the community as well go into the bank. And now, now that we're you know, such a large group, there's 30 of us total. And it started out as just five of us. It was five women. Originally, it was just me by myself. And then um, I was allowed to have four, four people come help. And from that, um, it just grew, you know, because I always envisioned that we could be doing this for the entire community. And one of the fears um, at that time that our leadership had is that if we, if we pay people to plant, then the people won't do it for themselves anymore. But I envisioned a total opposite effect that it would have. It would reinvigorate people to want to get involved with agriculture. It would start reminding people and it did work in that way. So after about five years of um, planting for the elders, um, he passed away. And at that time, um, I took over the farm and I was allowed to hire more people to come. And we um, agreed that we would grow food for the entire community. And at that time, the Council of Chiefs also wanted us to um, follow our traditional teachings. And that is also to put food away, to put seeds away for the future. Because for us, seeds are food as well. So, <clears throat> um, it's interesting, you know, I didn't realize like how, 
how much work we actually had to do. Uh, I had gone to the nation school at one point to do a um, presentation on three sisters and have the kids work on corn and shell corn and sort seeds. And then I had um, one of the students, I said, any questions? And one of the students said, yeah, where do we get the seeds to plant this corn? And I didn't realize that the students weren't aware that the, the corn is the seeds. And I thought, wow, I have to remember when I'm doing presentations that I start at the very beginning and, and don't leave out any details because you can't assume that everyone you're talking to knows these things. So it's been a journey. It's been a really wonderful journey. And just by opening this seed door, um, seeds just keep coming here to the Onondaga Nation. Seeds just keep coming to the Confederacy. It's almost like we woke them up and they were finally, by waking ourselves up, we woke them up to say, oh, there they are. And so now all these seeds are returning to us. So the way that we plant is, a tr is all traditional agriculture. So what, we're, what I mean when I say traditional agriculture, we're not using farming equipment to, you know, to weed, to uh, harvest, to process seeds or anything like that. Everything involves a human element. So it's part of a larger food sovereignty network. And we have three groups of people that work at the farm. So we have 15 women at any given point, you know, at, when, at the height of our season. And those 15 women do the traditional planting, weeding, tending of the gardens and the harvesting. And then we have 10 men that do hunting and fishing full time. So they're out in the forest hunting, fishing, gathering, things they find out in the forest. And then we have five people who stay with our seeds, our relatives at the farm when everybody else goes home at the end of the day. So they're kind of a, a security crew to keep our food secure. So there's a total of 30. And each person plays an integral role. And we all take turns um, tending the animals and the chickens at the farm. So it's an investment, you know, for us, the investment, the monetary investment is in the salaries of the employees. There is no profit that's returned by that investment that's financial because we don't sell any of the food. We don't sell any of the, the agriculture and we don't sell any of the meats. Uh, we also have a bite and farm as well with a herd of 80 bison that we we butcher and distribute as well to the community so um the it's just an investment in the community and then the the profit like i said before is in, in that food security so i can give a good example that when the pandemic struck people were in panic and whether you had thousand dollars or ten dollars in your pocket when you went to the store to buy something you needed it wasn't there and so at that time people began to realize that that piece of paper in their hand that that dollar bill whatever it was whatever denomination it was held no value because the item they needed was not there and community members started to call me and say we heard that you had put food away for us. Is this true? Is this? And it was like, yeah, we'll be fine. We'll be fine for about four or five years. Everybody here does not have to worry. And it really created a really big sense of security with the community because we didn't have to worry about food. We had food when people needed it to be able to give it to them. We had food to, um, produce communal meals, which we did. And then we had a drive-through pass. We would cook all traditional foods and have the community members, they could do a drive-through, pop their trunk, and we'd put the meals in the trunk and they kept going so that we didn't have to have contact. And those kinds of things, to me, well, we can't even place a value on that because we could have lived like that for five years if we had to, if, no, if none of the grocery stores were open. So that's the ultimate plan with our food security. And it's not something that um, has a financial profit, but
but it has the human element. So um, after we started the farm, the same year, there was about maybe six other people that I was in contact with that I knew through my seed circles and my food sovereignty, um, food summits, indigenous food summits that I had been to. Uh, we started, we got together and we, we thought we need to get a collective of indigenous people to all kind of get on this same page. And in order to do that, each community needs seeds. Each community needs their knowledge for their bioregion, for their nation or tribe, because we all do things a different way. And so we started a corn growing uh, organization and it was all indigenous corn growers. It's called Braiding the Sacred. And throughout, I didn't even realize how long it's been because it's now 2023. <laughs> but through these years, since 2015, when we started the, the farm project, um, Braiding the Sacred started at the same time. And we've traveled to 17 different uh, communities. We've reinvigorated the community and helped them get these communal gardens going, get everybody involved, get the youth involved. You know, every, every nation has a youth program usually, and they are able to participate in that as well. Um, but through that group, Braiding the Sacred, um, a seed collection had come to us that belonged to uh, what I call a master seed keeper, uh, was Carl Barnes. He was a Cherokee corn farmer from Oklahoma. And he created that uh, rainbow, the rainbow glass gem corn which was actually a Cherokee prophecy corn. And his collection, he spent his entire life just growing out seeds. And he never sold seeds either because he just felt like it was a, a human commodity. And to, um, he would just give them away and you maybe pay for the postage. That's how we roll. So um, Carl had passed and he had mentored a Cheyenne corn farmer from Oklahoma. And he ended up giving him the collection. His family gave him the collection after Carl's passing. And his name is Al Toops. And Al is uh, an amazing corn grower himself, but he felt like that collection was overwhelming. So he ended up uh, looking for someone who could help him with the grow outs and keep it going because he felt like I couldn't, I can't do what Carl did, I need help. And he reached out to us and he ended up sending the seed collection back home to the Onondaga Nation through Braiding the Sacred with me. And that's where we house the collection. And the collection has over uh, 4,000 varieties of indigenous corn from all over Turtle Island, North, South, Central America, uh, the Caribbean islands, Northern Canada, everywhere. And there's maybe five or 600 varieties of beans in that collection. And there's so many other wild grains and different things. I haven't gotten to those yet, but I'm still working on that. And so that community resource, I felt like it belongs to so many millions of people that I took that uh, topic to the Grand Council of Chiefs here in the Haudenosaunee Confederacy so that we as a collective, as a confederacy, would take not ownership, but stewardship of that seed collection. And that we would agree to protect it and to not allow it to become genetically modified and to maintain its true form as the creator had put it here and to rematriate those seeds back to their people. And it's been an amazing journey because so many different people, not in, not just in my own community, but all over the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, all six nations um, have helped with the grow outs of those things. And even beyond that, uh, people in different uh, communities down in the Southwest, the, mid the upper Midwest, the Southern Plains. So it's something that uh, to me, it, we don't call it a seed bank, we call it a seed sanctuary because it's just a temporary place, a sacred space that we're holding uh, these things. It's not a display. It's a living entity in it. And it's really powerful. And people who have come there have been changed by that. So when we talk about the things that we grow, and then, you know, we're doing our garden plans, and, and that happens like right now during the quiet time, 
I start thinking. I pay attention to what, um, what are the health matters with the people. And that will determine what foods I'm growing. What's the biggest, what's the biggest um, thing that we need to help increase the health of the people? And, and so there's a different thought process um, that comes from me when I'm laying out garden plans and when I'm putting in things for space and how much we can produce. And in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, okay, and then half of that is going into long-term storage for the future so that we always have that food security. Our teachings tell us to have seven years of food put away for all of our people. They talk about a time when food is not going to be available and only the people that have prepared will survive. And so, you know, we have to think of our, our young people, our children who have not even been, come here yet. That's our seven generation thinking. So that's kind of the, the basis of my garden plans. And it's really interesting, you know, to hear, um, hear other people who are so um, passionate and, and doing the same kind of work, but just trying to stay afloat, you know, to keep their projects going. So we have the same uh, mentalities. It's just a different uh, path to get there and, um, you know, different ways of survival. And I'm lucky that we definitely have support from our leadership, you know, from our chiefs, our clan mothers. Because when you're trying to do something communal, you need to have everybody on board. That's what makes things successful. And I think that's why uh, the Onondaga Nation Farm is a good example of that because we have everyone involved with it from chiefs, clan mothers, the children, uh, pe just people who wanna be like, they just wanna get away to a sanctuary, they'll come up to the farm. And there's so many, um, so many people that it has triggered that never planted before. So for example, we have a very small community when you wanna talk about square acres here, the Onondaga Nation, we're one of the smallest uh, land bases, I guess you could say in the Confederacy. And so the part that's actually able to be planting gardens on, we had 96 gardens um, in 2021, and that's the most we've ever had. And that's pretty amazing for a small community. In addition, um, to what we plant for the community. So now it's, it is working. It's triggering other people to get excited and to see what we're doing. And then them say, I want that in my yard. I want to do that too. And so the, the fear that the leadership had in the beginning that, well, we don't want people to get away from doing it. Um, it actually did have the opposite effect. So for the indigenous people also that are on this call, um, you know that we're always willing um, one of the things that used to take place that we kind of got away from was what, um, you know, we have a sing where people sing every year and the whole all six nations come to listen to all the different singers from everybody and it's really a good time and then there's a big social afterwards. But really that sing was based around a would be where all the nations used to travel to cut wood for that community and get everybody's firewood ready and that sing was an offshoot of that event kind of like a bee, a would be, they would call it. And we used to do the same thing with planting, planting, weeding, and harvesting. So we still continue to have the harvesting, the corn braiding bees, and but we got away from the planting and the weeding bees. And so I would like to see us get back to that in order to help other communities get these projects started um, because the investment is so huge and we all should have this food put away. And that's not just our bank, it's our future. You know, it's, um, it, it's based, our thinking is more based on survival for our descendants because somebody thought of that for us. So I think of all of the, the people who've been removed, who, people who were on the run during wartime, people who were under attack and they still carried those seeds. The seeds that we're planting now are the offsprings of that, that they did not eat them even when they were starving, they thought of us. And so now we have that distinct obligation to continue doing that ourselves. So it's just an interesting um, perspective, I guess, a different perspective. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what your um, time is. I'm around the time. I'm not sure what, I know you wanted to do questions. Yes, yeah, um, we do have some questions coming in. 
So I will, I'll bring those along to you now. Sarah from Tuckaway uh, says, looking to bridge these conversations. Um, she's interested in Angela's perspective on non-Indigenous seed growers, hoping to build relationships in which there's a commitment to offering back cultural royalties and rematriating seeds. Yeah, I think it's a conversation that does need to take place. And it's been pretty um, amazing, you know, because a lot of, uh, if you remember yesterday, for those of you who were here yesterday, I was saying that a lot of farmers, maybe not Indigenous, they have that same care and love for seeds that we do. And so we need to kind of uh, bridge those conversations. And a lot of people have been returning seeds, um, things that they grew in their family. I just recently had a, a Seneca variety of a seed given to me by a woman from Vermont who said, my family has been growing this for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's been passed down. And this is the, and this is the original indigenous woman that gave my great grandmother the seeds. So she had a little genealogy with the seeds and when she gave it to me, and I know people with that last name, and I reached out to them in Cattaraga, Seneca Nation, and that was their family seeds. So, you know, so it came back to them and through that channel. And so I'm going to return it back to them. And they're so excited, you know, to plant it this springtime. So, yeah, we do need to create um, space uh, for these conversations. And I always tell everybody, you know, you can reach out to me uh, via email. You can put my email in the chat. People usually um, like to contact me that way. Yes, we'll do. It's hard to remember email. <laughs> I have to look it up every day. I know because it has that little dot in the middle. I guess there must, <laughs> there must be a lot of Angela Ferguson's in the world. I don't know. <laughs> might be, might be. Um, Rebecca wrote that an Anishinaabe seed keeper and friend, um, oh, I don't know this word, on Manitoulin Island, yeah. mm -hmm. was asking about who to connect to in other First Nations who might be willing to share and exchange seed, um, and was just wondering if she can connect that person to you. Yes, yeah. Is that email a good way to do that? Yes. Awesome. All right, but we'll make sure we drop that in the chat. People can also reach out through um, Braiding the Sacred. We have a website ah. and there's videos and there's um, just to show the work that we've done. You know, I'm just giving you a brief oversight on this 20 minutes, but there's a lot of pretty powerful stuff on there. There's photographs, things you can look at there. Yes, and thank you, Rebecca, for dropping that website in the chat. Beautiful. I'm curious, Angie, um, if you are are finding that that youth, like really young people, are starting to get more involved again yeah. in gardening. Yeah. yeah, that was the goal of the group because there's a disconnect between our elders and our youth. Um, you know, we don't live the same way that we used to, and with this technological age, people aren't visiting. Um, you know, there's they're just not doing the things like we did when we were kids growing up. So if we don't bridge that gap, all that knowledge is going to be lost. So that was the original point of having Braiding the Sacred is to create a bridge for the youth in order to, uh, you know, retain all the encyclopedia of knowledge from our elders. Because that's our, our living library. Yeah, no, that, that's really good to hear. So I'm just doing a time check. It is 11 o'clock. We're going to pause let everybody get up stretch digest everything that we've just heard and um, in the chat box we'll, we'll write down this question but if you feel like sharing with us how you plan to use seed uh, it's always nice to see after you've heard a little bit um, what what your intentions are so if you want to drop that in We'll come back at 11.05 after everybody's had a chance to get up and move around. And if you think of questions for Angie or for Dan during that time, we'll circle back and do one more. Um, look for questions and then we'll move on to the next set of topics. But thanks everybody and we'll see you in five minutes.
Welcome back, folks. Nice to see answers coming into the chat. Feel free to keep listing those. It's uh, really fun to read what everybody is planning to do at SEED. And it reminds me to mention that um, we really ask Dan and Angela to focus on specific aspects of how SEED is being used. But for many, if, if not all of us, um, there's a whole continuum of use. So it's, it's great to see folks expressing that um, you're using seed in your communities, on your own farms, um, as part of your income stream. And uh, we fully expect that that's the outcome, is that, that folks will find all these different ways to use the seed. So thanks, everyone, for reminding me to touch on that, that this is, this is certainly um, a, a really diverse group of people, and it's a diverse way of, of interacting with seed. So keep them coming. And uh, I don't think I missed any questions. If I missed anybody's questions, feel free to drop them back down into the chat so I see them again. But I think I think we got them. So I will go ahead and pivot us on to the next section of today, which is looking at that seed shed and, and examining where seed comes from and where it's going. And we'll start that conversation um, by kind of continuing what Angela has been speaking about, which is um, different forms of community seed use. So first, we're going to talk about seed swaps and seed libraries. So I will pass it off to Natasha. Uh, Natasha has been doing seed swapping for a while now. If you didn't catch their introduction yesterday, um, I'll let Natasha go ahead and, and give a brief intro. And I think you had a few slides to share with us as well, Natasha. I do have a few slides. Yeah, I'm Natasha Field. I'm actually a technician working with Crystal uh, and a couple other specialists at the Eastern New York Commercial Horticulture Program. Um, but I've also been growing and saving seeds on uh, a garden scale, but a large garden scale for a number of years now, um, including doing a lot of seed swapping and things like that. Um, so let me share my... And some of this is places I've swapped seeds and places other people have swapped seeds. Um, and a lot of these are interesting ways to find. So the first place I actually went um, when I started doing seed swapping was actually to the Seed Service Exchange. Now, a lot of people may get seeds from them um, through their shop, but one of their main purposes when they first started and it still continues is to actually be an exchange where folks can um, send each other seed and you can find seed. So if you go to their website and you actually just go to exchange um, and then start searching seeds, you can look through a whole bunch of different categories. Uh, and then there's all these different types. And what you do is if, now I didn't put this in the slides, but if you click on a category, you can see a variety. You can see, you can log in and request um, to receive that variety. A lot of folks um, will just request that you cover postage or a small donation um, to, to send the seed. And most people are more than willing to send it. Um, they're quite happy to because they list these on here. I have also listed seed on the exchange. Um, and it's really neat when you have an unusual variety or something interesting or or even not super popular to see how many people are willing to request that from you and then you send out and and spread the seed around because it's such it's very interesting to talk with people and, and receive notes in your seed packets and things like that on what you've been doing and what's been going on um, so the website's a little um, odd to use it's not super um, easy to navigate, but once you get the hang of it, you gotta log in, you gotta make an account, that kind of thing. Um, there's also a physical copy of the um, exchange that gets sent out if you are a member and have a, and pay the, I believe it's like a print fee um, for that. So that's a really interesting place to start with a lot of varieties. Um, the actual Seed Savers Exchange also lists their Varieties that they offer in the exchange, but don't offer in the store. So you can um, get varieties from them as well, where they have some amount of information on there as well about the varieties. They usually do some kind of analysis and you can request those varieties. Um, something they also ask of you is if you request a variety from them, um, is they 
they don't require it, but they ask that you grow it out, harvest the seed, and then relist it. So it's available from more than one source. So that's the Seed Savers Exchange. Um, seed swaps. So I've used a number of online seed swaps. Um, there are groups on Facebook. There are groups on Reddit. Um, the caveat with this is use good internet safety. Don't post your address anywhere you that anybody can see it. Direct message people, you know, don't, if you have a PO box, this is a great time to use a PO box. Um, but a lot of them are Valentine's Day seed swaps coming up on Reddit, you know, so a lot of folks post there in search of and then a list of what they can offer. Um, I've used these a number of times. It's a similar thing on Facebook. There's a number of large groups that you can find out there. Um, I've done in-person seed swaps at conferences, which is a little bit different. Some folks get tables um, where they can spread all of the, the seed they have to offer. I've taken a little box around with all of my varieties and little bags and, and swapped them over to them. And that's just chatting with people. That's a great time to talk to people, um, to get to know them, to learn what they like growing, because everybody's got different things they're looking for with, for varieties. And if you've got one unusual variety, they might be looking for it. Uh, and you can swap it out with something they've got. So that's been a lot of fun to do that. Um, one of the first in-person seed swaps I did was actually at the, I believe it was 2019 uh, NOFA New York conference. So that was pretty fun. And it was at the, the, the seed conference. So that's also a possibility to do as well. And a lot of times regional networks, um, regional garden, gardening networks will also have in-person seed swaps in the spring. Um, that's kind of a, you know, 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 your, know your local area and see what you can find around there. Um, oops, if I've clicked on the thing to do that. So seed libraries. Um, it didn't seem in my searching that there was a lot in the Northeast. Um, but a good way to get started, actually, is um, Seed Libraries Summit is happening on February 11th. Um, it's a Saturday, I believe. And it's online, it's free, and it's there's some really good resources on their website to how to start a seed library in your local area and things like that. So I would say perhaps we need more seed libraries. And that is just, um, it's a system where you can check seeds out. They don't always require that you bring seeds back, um, but they usually take donations and things like that. So it's kind of a neat system that I think is working. I know there's quite a few in California and things like that. So I think maybe we need to do a little bit more of that in the Northeast it might be fun. Um, and then finally, um, swapping with friends and family and local community and online community as well. So I've done, you can see, I track my seed up at the top. Um, and so what I do is I put this list online for some friends. Um, and so the folks I talk to online can ask me to send them seed, which I do happily. Um, there, here are some of the crops I've sent to people and they've grown out, um, shared with friends and family, either locally or not. Um, I've done a lot of work with flax lately. So a friend and I are collab collaborating on flax production um, since I'm also involved in, involved in fiber production stuff. But it's, it's a joy to get pictures from people who have grown out stuff that I've sent them for. And it's just so much fun to see what they've done with it and grown it differently than me or similarly and to see what they do. So that's been a lot of fun to, to just give seeds to people because um, the thing is when you start saving seeds, you end up sometimes with a lot of seeds. <laughs> Even on a garden scale, I, I end up with more seeds than I can use for myself. And so being able to give them to other people and share them is just one of the greatest feelings because then they're enjoying something that I put some work into, but it's been fun work. Um, and so one of the main things I do is I grow weird varieties, unusual varieties. Um, so this is my, my chickpea collection that I've been growing out. Um, and it's been a lot of fun to say, hey, yeah, I'm growing chickpeas. Here, do you want some? Because people don't think of this area as a place you grow chickpeas. So it's been really, really fun to be able to to share this with folks I know and 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 don't know. So there's lots of options. All right. Thank you. That was fun. 
So I think um, I'll hold any questions and just pivot right to the other half of this um, presentation, which was the in-person um, seed exchange uses. And I will hand it off to Tina for that. And I, I'm i spacing out, Tina, do you have slides that you want us to share for this section? Oops, sorry. Uh, this is gonna be an Angie talk, I think. Oh. Shoot. Sure. Yeah, totally fine. Okay. Um, so I just want to share a couple of experiences quickly. I, I've been to a few seed exchanges, uh, seed swaps, they called them. It was my first time going to one because usually I do them in person, individual to individual. And I got so frightened because people were grabbing and just taking seeds off the table and they were just getting so excited and I can, I get that. But I was like, I leaned over my table and I covered all my seeds and I was like, everybody step back <laughs> because, you know, we had put them in little envelopes, right? And they were labeled. And then we had the actual seeds themselves in little bowls in the front so people could see what they were inside the packages. And the con I had to re-educate people on the concept of seed swapping because they were just taking and a swap means you're giving something back in exchange for that. So people um, kind of caught on and I was like, we need to talk about it because I wanna tell you how you plant this. I wanna hear what you're growing and how you do it and what we're going to actually exchange, right? You're gonna give me something, I'm gonna give you something. And that's the, our economy, right? We're making that even exchange. So, um, yeah, so now our seed exchanges and seed swaps, I'd like to recommend this for um, people who participate in them, is we would bring the seeds in jars and the people could view the seeds in the jars and then the jars were not opened, right? So if you saw something that was like, this is calling me, right? It's speaking to me. I want, I like this. I want to grow this. Then we started that conversation. So we had many people at the table, not just one person, so that we could all conversate and, and educate people together. And then we created friendships, relationships with the people. And it led to you know, some long-term uh, friendships at these places because seed swaps can be scary. I don't know if anybody's participated in them, but there's like seeds flying everywhere and it gets really nuts. <laughs> but um, you know, when I when I do it that way, I, I put the seeds in these little boxes and and it's like you can view them. It's like a jewelry box and the lid flips open so people can have contact. They can touch the seeds. They can feel the seeds. They can look at them. And I think there's more respect for the seeds that way instead of just um, grabbing an envelope and going and then you get home and you don't know what it is. And I've had some uh, non-Indigenous farmers that I've exchanged seeds with give me some really good stuff. You know, like uh, I heard Natasha talking about, you know, those, those things that are so different, right? And they're so exciting to plant. And that anticipation is what this is really all about, what we're talking about here. You know, that connection you make, that excitement, and then you have that passion for growing it and that tender care, you're gonna really pay attention to that. So um, this year in 2022, we had a visitor come up from Guatemala and Guatemala is being deforested at such a, a, a fast rate. They're so afraid they're gonna lose their rainforest and their, their, uh, their traditional seeds. So they brought the original, um, oh, it's not quinoa, what is it called? I'm having a, men I'm drawing a mental blank. Amaranth, the original amaranth plants from Guatemala, they brought them up here and they planted them on the Cayuga Nation, they planted them on the Seneca Nation and they planted them on the Onondaga Nation because they're so fearful that they're going to lose their original variety of that, that they wanna acclimate it, you know, due to climate change. So we're all struggling with this, uh, with the Corn Belt that used to be across the Midwest. I don't know if anybody's traveled through there, but I have on many of my seed trails and if anyone has been through there, even where Monsanto has their seed plots, I've driven through their, 
their seed plot area. And it looks like it looks like the entire Corn Belt across America has been raped. The land is completely, the soil is basically dead. There wasn't any weeds. I drove 167 miles and I didn't even see a weed on the side of the road, no trees. I didn't see any birds. I didn't see any uh, critters running around on the ground. And it's terrifying because now the Corn Belt is moving north. It's moving even northern into Canada. Places that couldn't grow corn before can grow corn in Canada because of the climate warming. So these are all things we need to pay attention to. Um, and as seed keepers and, and farmers, we all need to communicate because, um, you know, we're gonna, farmers are gonna save the world. That's basically it. And it doesn't matter what color you are. So we need, um, we need to all really stay invested in this and protecting all of our seeds. Thank you. I, I really love the idea of um, reculturing ourselves as we, we think about how to do seed exchanges. Um, also because we've all kind of learned how to, or we, we've unlearned how to be human in the last couple of years. So it's a great moment to have that reminder that you know we all live in relationship and we should honor that. <laughs> That's great. So I think, I think I've been keeping an eye on the chat. I think we're pretty good. Um, so I will keep us moving through these topics because some of these will take a little bit longer than others. Um, let's see. Ah, uh, yes. Now, and feel free if, if folks come up with questions and we want to circle back, everyone stays on the Zoom. So we can always circle back if you want to. Uh, but now we'll go ahead and move on to this idea of um, direct sales from the farm. And um, I'm excited to have Dan talk about this because um, Dan Dan is a little bit further into this than, than anybody else that's involved in this project. So it'll be interesting to hear um, the benefits and, and potential complications of, of doing this now. So I, uh, I got some slides and uh, do I? Yes, I do. Um, <laughs> I'll just bring them up. Um, and um, just another moment. So I mainly have a bunch of pictures of things that um, we've thought about as running, running a seed company um, over the years. And I have a few reflections afterwards, and I'm happy to talk more about it, specific things uh, that people want to know uh, as questions. Um, but so one thing that is really important to know is that there are different regulations in the US and in Canada, and I don't know the American ones, and I think that they really vary from state to state, and I have a general feeling they're more strict than many of the Canadian ones. So just, just know that before, especially, and probably the bigger you are, the more it matters. If you're very small, I don't think people are going to care as much, but the bigger, uh, more people know about you, the more it's important to know about this. Um, so I know this is direct from the farm or farm sales, but I think these days online store is usually what that means for a lot of us. And um, so you have to have think about, about that. Uh, we use a Shopify store. I think if you're going online, if you don't have a lot of web skills, something like Shopify, possibly Square would be good ways to go about that. Um, and I think you should really choose something that's easy to use, doesn't, doesn't use a lot of customization and try to use it out of the box. Um, now, a big question also is, are you certified organic? And um, this is also true if you're selling seed on contract, but there's probably more demand for organic seed. Um, and if you're working with organic farmers, they're gonna need the seed to be organic. That being said, you know, if you're a small bioregional company, there's definitely people interested in seed of all types, even if it's not organic. But I think it's a big question to consider. And if you're buying seed from other people and you're organic, they're going to have to be certified organic also. So that's that's a kind of commitment that you do. And that can be a challenge. We're certified organic. And that means that there's a few great seed people we know that have great varieties that we don't carry because they're not organic, even though we'd love to. Um, Germ tests is a very big thing. And this might fall a lot into the regulations of where you are. Where we are, we're able to do our own germ tests. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, and um, we you know, essentially use 
a converted, this is like a, like a restaurant kitchen fridge kind of, um, and we haven't done anything to the fridge itself, but there's a, um, an incandescent light bulb at the bottom that's on a thermostat and it keeps at 30 degrees Celsius. So that's I guess 86 uh, Fahrenheit during the day and then 68 Fahrenheit at night. Um, and, you know, a lot of seed germinates well at that. We have other conditions for other kinds of seed too, but um, uh, this is, it's important to sell seed that germinates. <laughs> People don't like it when it doesn't germinate at their house. Um, then there's the packaging. So this is our, our original packs, you know, craft envelopes. And we had Avery labels that we printed. And then um, we moved into um, um, packs that, you know, were, were nicer. We bought from Cambridge Pacific and then printed ourselves. And now we have um, actual packs with envelopes. Um, we sell on retail seed racks. And that makes a really big difference to have something really fancy. The more direct your contact with the person, the less the fancy that one, the, the, the pack needs to be fancy. Um, um, and then this is how we pack seeds a, a lot is uh, with seed scoops. And so each pack is a certain weight that we're targeting and we'll calibrate uh, the specific, we'll choose a scoop that's that kind of pack uh, and uh, we'll, we'll calibrate, we'll, We'll kind of figure out what the scoop is for the right pack and then pack that way. Um, these are gunpowder scoops. This is a really easy way to uh, to go for them. You can find them at different hunting shops or gun shops or Amazon. It's like 15 or 20 bucks. It's a, You have really a lot of small um, uh, different scoop sizes. Um, it's a good starting point in addition to um, working with like teaspoons, uh, tablespoons of that kind of stuff and um when we're packing by hand you know it's definitely a group affair um uh, a team of people doing it um we have i don't have pictures of this we have now moved we actually have a seed counter that we've purchased that we're doing still some by hand but we're doing increasing amount of stuff that's packed by machine it is a lot of work on people and there is repetitive motion um and so that's one of the reasons that we've moved to a seed packing machine um to avoid that repetitive motion. Now you have to think about where your seat is going to be. When we started, it was in um, a, uh, it was in a, what was it? <laughs> it was in a room of our apartment. Um, we, you know, we had a, a two bedroom apartment. One of the bedrooms was a, a seat company and there was stuff everywhere. Um, over time, you know, as the orders increase, we had to get more organized. This is still at home. And then um, eventually we moved into a on farm uh, a, a job site trailer on farm um, you know with with better organization at this point we have just just moved to another building like a warehouse uh, a couple roads a couple of you know about five minute drive from our farm to be able to have more space and that's really as we're as we're growing as we grow space is really important for people as much as for the seeds um, here are a few direct marketing challenges like if you're growing, you know, vegetables or seed for bulk, often the challenge is the production, you know, and if you want to make more revenue or grow more stuff, you either need more people or you need to really improve efficiency. But when you're running a retail company, it's different. The, the challenge is just like it's marketing, you know, because often the margin that you can make on a seed pack, you probably have more seeds than you can sell of some varieties. So it's the marketing of how to get people, how to, to, to buy your seeds, how to distinguish yourself. Um, there's the website management. Um, it doesn't have to be complicated, but it does have to be accurate and making sure your inventories are in line with, with what you actually have. And there's the um, warehouse management. Apologize for another typo. Um, and that warehouse management is, is really important of how you organize things so that you can find them um, and how you can run through germination tests in a timely manner. Um, uh, so these are some of some direct marketing challenges that uh, that are there. And, uh, you know, I guess I could here also is kind of just really dealing directly with customers. Customer service is another big thing. And that's something that when we we started off growing seed for other people and seed for ourselves. And over time, we gradually transitioned to completely doing our own uh, selling seed, um, mostly directly to, to to gardeners and farmers. And um, one of the reasons we did it slowly is that with when you're selling seed, if you compare it to selling vegetables, if you sell vegetables at a farmer's market and somebody has a problem with something, they find a, a worm in a caterpillar in a in a 
broccoli head or there's a hollow heart of a, of a potato and they come back the next week and they're not happy about it, you can give them something and you can smooth it over and you can build a really strong relationship based on these disagreements. If you're a retail seed company and people just click on your website and they order your seed and they get it in the mail and then they sow it you know, five months later, something doesn't work out. They don't really remember what they didn't like about it. They just, that seed didn't work. And then the next year they go to order seed and they just remember not liking your seed company. And you have no way to, to, to respond to that. So that's something uh, is that it's still about relationships and you want to be able to have good quality seed, good customer service, um, uh, as much good customer service as good quality seed when, when you're doing that. So those are a few of my thoughts. And, um, when we get into questions later, I'm sure to, I'm happy to answer anything else that people uh, want to know about this kind of stuff. I wonder if it would be helpful to hold questions until after we do the wholesale discussion, and then we can toggle back and forth, um, since you also have experience with the wholesale production, Dan, so it's kind of that evolution. That sounds great. Perfect. All right. Then we will do that, and I will have Heron reintroduce himself and talk to us a bit about uh, wholesaling seed. Hi there. Is Amira with us? Uh, she, is her phone working? I know Amira is having to... difficulties, so oh, okay. it has okay. become the Heron Green Show. Uh, oh, Green. this and is now. bad. <laughs> the last thing we were all hoping for. I'm looking forward um, to Karenism. So, um, what is what is selling seed on contract or wholesaling, which are actually are two different things. Um, and there's there's something called a seed contract. This is a generalized term. It means that a retail seed company, generally one that most, there's some companies that strictly sell seed, which means they pack seed and they have an existing business. Um, they don't necessarily grow their own seed. They may grow a very small amount of seed. Who am I? Oh, sorry. I'm Heron Breen. I live in central Maine. Um, I spent about 20 plus years working in the seed trade. Um, and then also at the same time, I've been growing seed on my farm. Uh, that's about a nine acre uh, leased land. And then there's probably another four to six acres that I also lease. Um, so there's these, you know, this concept of what's a seed contract. And that is basically a seed company is saying, I'm looking for a farmer to grow this specific variety. Okay. And so that's maybe a tomato, it may be a bean, it may be anything. It may be something you're totally unfamiliar with and it's often a variety you've never grown. Um, so when people say, yeah, tomato seed, well, guess what? Every tomato is different, which means that some have more seeds, some have less seeds, and there is no average. There's not even average across types. So just be aware that part of growing seed is oftentimes the company has no idea how to grow seed. I just want to be totally upfront with you. Sometimes the people that are calling you or that are reaching out to you via email don't know how to grow beans themselves or have never saved tomato seed in bulk themselves. But there's some very important things that you need to know as a seed grower and as a farmer, which is things like how many plants do I start? What's my plant population or, or direct seed population to meet this amount of seed? So if someone says, hey, I'd love for you to grow two pounds of tomato seed, Okay, well, in some varieties that could be 100 plants. In some varieties that could be 300 plants. In some varieties that could be 60 plants. And obviously your profitability, bed for feet, per, you know, bed foot and rate labor and extrapolating these and trying to come up with this is a conversation, should be ideally a conversation between you and the seed company. So it behooves you to be I'll just use tomatoes as an example. First of all, you need to be really good at growing tomatoes. So you don't wanna be contracting with seed but if you don't know how to grow the crop, in my opinion. Um, that's a risk to you and the other person. So if you have, a, as a market grower or as a gardener or a homesteader deluxe, if you have proven that you can grow paste tomatoes and that you understand the odds and ends of growing tomatoes and growing a population of that size, that's where you're that's where you're sort of like creating a contract is there's terms 
And there's been a standard model where the company is kind of providing terms, but let's just be clear, a contract is an agreement between you and the company. So when you sign that, their terms become your terms. So it's better to make sure that your terms are reflected on the document. So there's been a movement of those of us that are working in SEED um, to revise and basically create uh, different standards or different process standards where a contract is not something somebody hands you um, and says, do this. Now, if you think about this, like if you're going to ask a carpenter to grow your to build you a house, like what do you know about building a house? You can say, I would like this house, you know, I'd like a certain blah, blah, blah. well, there they're gonna tell you like how many nails and board feet and what the materials are. You're the farmer, actually, you're the one who actually knows the things. Believe it or not, the seed company sometimes does and sometimes doesn't. It's great working with a seed company that the person like you know, like Dan has actually grown seed and can actually tell you. What, what's going on, when to plant, all those kinds of things. Um, this germination thing is also very important because the seed company is going to hand you stock seed and that stock seed should be good, which means that you ideally want to have stock seed that germinates because you really only get one shot at your crop plan for that season. And this stock seed is a huge variable. So you're, you're really in this creating a process of you know, in tomatoes, understanding what kind of tomato is this? Is this a seedy tomato? Is this a light seeded tomato? And then your price will increase. You know, if it's a light seeded tomato and you need to grow, you know, 250 plants to get, you know, a pound of seed, which some paste tomatoes might, that might be the case or, or two pounds of seed, um, then you're going to need to charge more per pound, quite a bit more than you would if you were growing a tomato that you'll need 60 plants to make a pound. So this discussion helps you frame that price and helps you understand what is it that you're committing to in terms of processing and labor. Um, and at the end of the year, the idea is that you're giving this seed dried and of high quality, you know, processed, grown to the standards, which are isolation distances. We've talked about this earlier yesterday, some of those things. Um, that seed comes back to the company and they germinate, they ger actually do a germination test to be clear that it's met their quality standards and then you get paid. So there's a couple different types of contracts. Uh, one is called a segmented payment contract. That's where actually you've made an arrangement where you get paid a certain percentage of the contract even before the seed's been delivered. So there are seed growers that are starting to do this where they've earned their keep, they've showed that they can grow seed. And so they say, actually, regardless whether the seed crop is successful, I'm gonna demand 25%, you know, at a certain time of the year, 25% at harvest, and then you can send, you know, pay me the rest based on the quality of the seed. So a person is basically saying, my terms are, I need this amount of money to cover my costs, my production costs, and then I'll take, you know, basically the, bonus quote is whatever is the quality of that seed, then I'll take the other half. There's a balloon contract, which is where you grow and do all this work and then you get paid. The challenge of doing seed work is in that model, sometimes you don't get paid until January. Um, so you might've started those tomato seeds in April or March, but you might not get paid from that whole entire process until November or even February. So there is an element here where it's a little bit different than growing a regular crop where you're going to market and you're getting retail and the value is returning to you. So that capital holding has a cost. So just again, there's a group of us who are seed growers who've been meeting and discussing uh, different contract modules and sharing with each other and also going to start having we've been had we've had conversations with seed companies, we're going to start having more conversations with seed companies to kind of empower some of this uh contract process and, and so this contract process is how this sort of, sort of normal understood version of how seed is grown is there's seed growers those are big they can people be growing you know acres of beans um or they can be a small a farmer growing a two or three or four different things as an addition to their farm income uh there's another type of contract or not contract but a way this works and people often get those confused there's something called a purchase order and that's where someone is already growing something. So you're a farmer that maybe you grow a certain watermelon or you grow a certain bean and you grow it for your own use or you grow it for multiple companies. Um, and someone says, I would love to grab 200 pounds of your bean. I would, you know, Fedco or some other company would like to buy, you know, this. 
it's something you're already doing and you supply the stock seed and it's already part of your process. And basically they, they trust you that you know what you're doing and you sort of set the terms and the delivery and all those other things. So those are oftentimes people confuse those things. Um, so there's things that you do because you're already doing them and there's things that people ask you explicitly to do. Sometimes the lines between those are, va are vague. Um, generally seed companies start to reach out to growers or growers reach out to seed companies. But in general, you know, seed companies are always in theory looking for growers because there's lots of needs for certain types of seeds to be grown. So anytime you are feeling like you wanna say, hey, consider me for the next year, the earlier you do that. So for, even now, if you are reaching out to a Fedco or a Johnny's or a High Mowing or a Hudson Valley or a Fruition or whoever, Turtle Tree, um, you could say, hey, I'm interested in growing seed uh, for 2024. It might already be the time has gone by for that. So that's where, you know, there's there's some contracts that might be cite, not cited already. They're, they're, oftentimes they still are looking for people, but they're great to hear from you for the next season. So that gives them an opportunity to talk with you, learn about what kind of soil you have, where you're growing, what's your experience, you know, the zone you're in, you know, just sort of what your, what your desires for this. Do you want to grow one or two things or do you want to grow 10 things? Um, you know, do you're interested in herbs or flowers or, you know, are you interested in experimenting with somebody, something, have you already grown seed? And that conversation can happen over the course of a, a season so that when the seed company generally starts to say, hey, I'm locking contracts in, that's in like November, December, January. So that's kind of when a lot of that final, we need this done and we'd love you to do it. Um, oftentimes, a seed company is asking you to grow more than one year's worth of their seed. If they're smart, they're asking you to grow two to three years worth of their seed for that item. Um, that allows them to not have to, you know, they have their inventory and they, you know, can can um, not have to grow all the same things every cycle. Um, so sometimes you're like, oh, I, I grew this tomato and then the next year they have me grow another tomato. That's because they have enough seed from that one tomato for a year or two. Um, so you taking good records of these things, you know, cataloging what you're doing, all the, you know, how what, how you saw that it grew, that there's individual quirks to every variety. Um, ideally, you're saying to the seed company, I'd like to grow that again, or I wouldn't like to grow that again. And it's, it's actually a good idea to grow the same crop repeatedly if you have a good skill at it and that's been working for you because the more you grow a particular variety, the, generally the more profitable you are at growing it. Um, so I'm going to stop there and see if there's any questions about this kind of thing. I'm going kind of giving an overview. It's hard to do much more than that in about five or so seven minutes. Um, but if folks are interested in hearing more about this group of seed growers, I'm going to put my email in the chat um, and folks are welcome to get a hold of me and we'd love to have you join that conversation and understand things, how seed yield information, seed yield, seed yield data and contract negotiations are hugely important. Thank you, Perrin. And just as a reminder to folks that are actually enrolled in the course, um, if you choose to go the wholesale seed route, um, we are working with a variety of seed companies, a few of whom are actually on the call. So welcome seed companies. Um, so we're working with these seed companies to select varieties that they are guaranteeing that they will buy if we meet certain quality standards. So um, if, if this is your first shot at seed growing and you wanna try the wholesaling, um, we can at least take the searching out a buyer piece out of the equation for a year to let you get some experience with that. Um, and same thing in year two, folks that do the course in the second year will we'll go through the same experience. So one of those things, when one of the questions in the chat is have you know success about growing some seed and then searching for someone to buy it. And the answer to that, if the company is smart, they're going to grow your lot of seed, a sample of that before they're going to buy it. So you can say, I've got this great thing, but my experience as someone who works at a seed company is I want to grow a small sample of that in trials to know that it's true to type before I put it in my catalog, if I haven't done business with you before. So the, the answer is maybe, depending on how desperate they are or if they know you or you have a good reputation or what have you, but growing things and then searching for people, it isn't a bad thing, but you have to kind of have a reputation and a communication. I wouldn't necessarily assume they're gonna buy all 20 pounds of something. Oftentimes a grower will grow a bunch and a seed company will go, oh, you only have 20 pounds? I'll take three pounds. 
you know, and, and that's, be, that's sort of like maybe because they want to buy some of it and see how good the quality is. Maybe they'll come back the next year and buy some more. So your, the quantity you grow versus what you're, you're going to sell, that's why a contract and a communication is good, even if you don't have a contract. I've grown things for seed companies where I've just let them know, I'm growing a bunch of something. And they're like, great, let's talk in the fall. But they already knew that I had it, and we had that conversation back in March. So it wasn't formal, but at least that we were on the same page. Perfect. Thank you. So doing a quick time check, we've got about 45 minutes left. Um, I think I saw one more question, and then we'll it's circle 15, to the Crystal. whole 15, 15, oh, 15 minutes. minutes. What did I just say? I don't even know. Words are hard today. Can't wait for later sessions. Um, actually, I think we're good. I think we're good. Yeah. So in that case, um, in the last 15 minutes, we will move on to talking about um, on-farm or home seed use. Oh, I there was a question. I, I remembered it, even though I can't see it. Um, it was about minimum amounts that seed companies would take. Um, so, you know, what's, what's the lower threshold that somebody could produce and have it purchased by a seed company? So again, that has someone to do with like the seed company might say, you know, we have two or three different people producing seed for Cherokee purple tomato, for example. Okay. So if your strain is good and you're good at it, then they are, might be happy growing, buying, um, half a pound from you. Um, it's, it's slightly the handling of a lot incoming. It's like, well, no, it doesn't make sense for me to buy, you know, a 10th of a pound of something because I, I have to go through enough effort to make that into packets that, um, to designate a certain lot and run that, that, uh, and record that if it's organic and jump through those hoops, um, that generally, you know, for a contract, seed companies are, you know, looking for somewhere between you know, a quarter pound and three pounds. That's kind of the active price for some after space for something like a tomato or a pepper. Um, and it, it sometimes depends. Sometimes if you're a new grower, they'll give you a small contract because they don't want you to be over your head. Um, they'll give you a half pound tomato contract and say, see what happens. Um, and so that could be 20 plants, depending on the variety. So the, the baseline isn't biting off a whole ton. Great. Thank you. There's also a question about um, intellectual property, which could get slightly detailed. So I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind um, answering that one in the chat, Heron. Sure. And, and we'll pivot for this last 13 minutes um, to discussing on-farmer or home seed use, which I think all of our mentors and speakers have experience with. So I'll open it up to the whole group to talk about that. Um, I personally think this is a great place to start your seed saving journey because it takes all that pressure off. You know, you're, you're not immediately jumping into a contract or trying to grow for other people. And it allows you to get a sense of, of how this whole thing works. So um, I know my gateway was Broccoli Rob. And it was kind of accidental, <laughs> but yeah. you know, once it once it bolts, and you're like, well, okay. Then all of a sudden, it's setting seed, and you're like, okay, in a tunnel, mind you. Um, so then I had broccoli rab seed. And I was like, oh, that was cool. So I, I'm curious to hear from other folks about, um, you know, if you think this is a great place to start, how you're doing on farm seed use now, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I'm gonna just to start in with where I left off at that is that many of us who are farmers in this space, and I think a lot of folks got into this this way, they're at a farmer's market and somebody approaches them and says, oh, you just, you grow such great tomatoes. I have this, you know, family tomato. Or they bring a sample of a tomato to the farmer's market, to their farmer of choice, their favorite farmer, or something like that. And somebody wants to share with you their family heirloom um, in, because they see that you're doing a good job and that you seem knowledgeable. And um, that's often how a lot of my friends have gotten into this is somebody handing them something that's special or that there's a variety that they couldn't find anymore or they bought some seed that they were reliant upon and it was crossed up. I mean, it wasn't true to type. And they said, oh, if I'm gonna get this and I can't like plant uh, a quarter acre of winter luxury pumpkin and have them all turn out like this if I'm going to be growing this variety and I have a market for this. 
So I better start doing that myself or figuring out how to do that myself. Uh, and this is super traditional, you know, as we go back to the beginning yesterday, so many farmers uh, of all origins grew their own seed and shared seed with each other, but specifically, you know, grew their own seed and always to have backup. Um, this is very traditional with bean varieties. Um, most of the farmers I know, and many of them have retired now, but growing traditional bean varieties, those are often strains that they've been growing their entire farming cycle, whether that's 40 years or 20 years. So to me, this is how I started in this space as a market farmer, also as a seed saver. So many of us doing this work wear like 10 different hats, um, was to preserve some old heirlooms and some interesting varieties, also to see if those had legs in the marketplace. And the only way is I was going to increase that seed for my handful was to do it myself because no one else is selling these varieties. Believe it or not, there's varieties that are not in seed catalogs. Uh, and a lot of them are really good. And a lot of them are really precious and that there's very few seeds. So how do you as a farm start in that space? Like that's often how so many of the folks I know growing this have started with something that they appreciated or loved and they knew it was rare. Um, and sometimes that's something that they started selling to a seed company later down, down the road um, to share with others. And I'll change, I'll stop, let other folks join in. Thanks, Aaron. Natasha. Yeah, I would say I started on a garden scale. And one of the reasons I did it was sometimes an accident. Sometimes I let the peas go over. And sometimes it was deliberate because I wanted to be able to keep those seeds on hand every year. And one of the strategies I did was, um, since I eat a lot of the, the things I grow, um, depending on what it is, I would set aside half of the harvest for seed and then half of the harvest for eating. And then as the years have gone on and I've grown the same varieties, what I do is I just simply work from the oldest seed first and bring it forward um, to grow that seed out in, in rotation in a way um, to make sure that nothing is getting too old and I'm still growing out seed from each year. Sometimes I'll mix lots um, depending on how wild I want to get, but it's a good way to get started is just start with something you already know how to grow and just let it go to seed. And depending on what it is, it, it may be easier or harder, but even things like tomatoes, you can get a lot of seed off of one plant of a tomato, you know? So it's, it's a good way to, even if you're not going to sell it, to at least save some and give it a try. And it helps you build that experience. Get a set of seeds greens, which aren't very expensive. And you can do a lot of work with just hand tools and, and a little bit of time, so. Thank you. Any of our other panelists wanna jump in here? Are we content? I'd love to, I'd love to jump in. Um, you know, I, I think that if you're going to start saving seed as a commercial part of your business or to provide to larger communities, you should start for your own use. And it's really where you're going to learn the experience. And I think that when you start saving seed, you shouldn't worry too much about isolation distance or population size. It's great to be aware of them, but I, I think you can not really worry about them too much and really marvel in the amazing thing that a plant going to flower is and giving seed is and just building the skills. I think that's really, really important. And um, uh, I think, you know, so there's a lot of learnings that you do. Like one of my first biggest seed crop, first big seed crops was an arugula seed crop, a like arugula crop that we planted early for a market crop. And then we hadn't harvested it. And then it, it bolted and it dried down before we ever tilled it in. And I harvested the seed and I got a couple of pounds out of it. And I used that seed for years. Um, and for a couple of years, I had a hard time getting another seed crop as good because I was always planting too late in the season. And it's when you're a market grower, it feels like things are going to seed all the time and you never can get the vegetable. But once you're a seed grower, it can be really frustrating to get them to go to seed at the right time. Um, so that's that's something that is a, like that's all the skills that you gain uh, in that part where you're playing with it. I think the more you can play, the better you're going to be when you when you dedicate into it. Um, crops that I think are really, really great. For, for, for saving seed are any OP tomatoes, hot peppers and sweet peppers. Um, and I know that, you know, these plants can cross a lot more 
then some sources will say they can, but I wouldn't worry about 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 pollination, uh, cross pollination if you're not selling the seed. And you know, if there's an OP tomato that you like, save the seed, grow it out the next year. If there's something that's crossed up in it, it's going to be edible. If you don't like it, don't save that seed. If you're fascinated by it, save it. Though you're going to get a whole bunch of new things when you when you save that seed. But so I I think that a, a, an important part of seed saving is discovering all those little mysteries and uh, you know miracles of cross pollination, and 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 that's something that's as important as learning 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 how to do it. One thing I would recommend keeping separated is hot peppers and sweet peppers. They do cross, and that's something that. You don't want to disappoint people who are looking for a hot pepper by giving them a sweet one by accident. Um, and um, and so that's one of the few places I would really worry about it. In the squash world too, once you know your species that cross, that's something you can get some funny things that might not be as tasty. Um, but otherwise, um, don't worry too much. And now I think you should start with a few crops, like don't go overboard. And also one of the things, so there's the skills of cleaning the seed that's important. There's also the confidence in the seed that you have to build. And the first time you're going to save seed, you're going to be afraid of what it's going to give the next year. And, or, or you're, maybe you should be, <laughs> maybe you maybe feel too cocky, but you're going to, you're not going to know what's going to happen. And the next year, if you grow it and it does well, you're going to feel more confident. And if you keep doing that, you really gain that confidence. And that's kind of what's missing when you're a new seed, seed grower. And so with, with arugula or with any brassica green, if you harvest it in early August, the seed, and you clean it, two weeks later, you could be sowing that same seed. And you know if you have a salad green production, you might have um, 200 bed feet of, uh, of, a, of a tatsoi or mizuna, and you'll see quickly if it's crossed up or not. So within two weeks, you can know if that seed is good. And so quickly, you're going to gain confidence with a brassica repa like that. Whereas if you're talking about a zucchini, um, you harvest the seed, you know it crosses with everything, you're kind of afraid about it. The next year, you grow out 25 plants, and then maybe you see crossing, and then you're worried, or you don't see crossing, and then you're wondering, did I just, just 25 plants enough to see it? And it takes years of growing cucurbits or squash to really get comfortable with being able to say this lot is going to be true to type based on what I did and based on my experience. So that's something that um, is, is that getting that experience. And that's something as working with a seed company also um, a, a, on a contract basis, they're going to want to gain confidence in you, especially if you're an unknown quantity who hasn't grown seed for anybody else. Um, but uh, those are some thoughts about seed on farm use. Just do it, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Oh, uh, I, had, I had one last thing I wanted to say is um, you should treat when you when you when you if you have a commercial farm that you're relying on the seed to prov produce a crop that you're going to sell. And this is your livelihood. You should tr treat the seed that you saved as a trial at first. And that means that if you growing a thousand tomato plants only grow 10 percent from your own seed that first year. And if it does well, increase it the same way you'd increase any successful trial. And if it doesn't do well, figure out, change it the next year and then keep trying. So that's, that's just, um, don't jump all in right away. That's a great tip. Thank you. I did see Angie unmute as well. So I want to give you um, the last word here um, before we formally end the session. Um, and I also acknowledge that there's a few questions left. So if people need to jump off right at noon, we'll, we'll let that happen, but then we can also stick around for a second and answer some of these remaining questions. But first, uh, did you still want to take a moment, Angie? Yeah. Um, I didn't have much to say about that except for a couple, just a couple of comments of things I heard today that I really enjoyed, but, um, one thing Dan mentioned I really liked is like, people have to remember we're organic farming. So bugs and worms and little things like that, that's all part of it because we're not using pesticides. And it's, um, you have to reacclimate some people when they buy seeds or they buy uh, foods that don't look as perfect as they would see in a grocery store because, you know, they're not, there's no pesticides on them. So sometimes visitors come along with some of the, things. Um, but what I wanted to say is that um, one of our Haudenosaunee methods for protecting things like that is using wood ash. So wood ash um, is a good pesticide, you know, to protect your seeds out there in the garden, just putting it in a sock and sprinkling that. 
and people who don't have a, a wood stove in their home, you can actually get that at your local, um, like a barbecue. Here in Syracuse, we have dinosaur barbecue. They're always giving away the wood ashes and they use hardwood ashes, so that's good. Um, or if you have any local barbecue, but that's a natural pesticide. And it's helped a lot with the squash bugs and different things that sometimes can interfere with your seed production. You know, that you might plant things and then they don't make it to harvest because they've, you know, they've stolen it from you. So I just wanted to mention that. And then um, I also like the philosophy of growing things yourself before you're sharing that seed and doing those trials because it takes a little while, you know, to learn the ins and outs of those plants. And we've used that word relationship a lot today and yesterday, but you know, you're not going to be able to partake in any um, information exchange if you haven't done it yourself. And so starting small and growing, you know, doing smaller amounts in the beginning and then growing so that you don't get overwhelmed, that's, that's like the key right there. And then each year as your learning capacity has, has grown, then you can plant more. So I always tell people just plant as much as you can manage yourself that first time around and then grow from there. So that's all I wanted to share. Thank you, Angela. Um, so it is, it is noon. I wanna formally close the session by thanking you, Angie and Dan and Tina and Heron and Natasha for sharing all of your wisdom with us. Um, and now if, if folks need to hop off, I will invite you to do so. Um, we'll try to uh, circle back to any questions that Heron hasn't answered. Heron's been on fire in the chat. Uh, <laughs> so actually Heron, now that, now that you've been answering questions, are there any that are hanging out here that we should loop back to? Oh, you're no, muted. I I think we're good. I mean, I think overall people are just interested in more, you know, like we're skimming the surface on a lot of these things. And I think, you know, it's hard to wrap it for not, some of us are, you know, we're not all suited for this, you know, um, there's a lot we're leaving out. So just know that a lot of this is going to happen in our coursework, but also in the mentorship work, we're going to have longer time to talk about a lot of these things. So there's a, a bunch of to expand on, and there's lots of ways up the hill and lots of places to start. Perfect. Yes. And as a reminder, um, Tina just dropped in the chat to all of the tribal seed keepers that are on the call that that will be doing um, mentorship meet and greet this afternoon. And that applies to everybody. So if you're involved in the course for this season, um, please do come this afternoon. It will be an opportunity to meet the mentors that you'll be working with and to also meet each other. We'll, we'll have smaller groups that are able to actually talk back and forth. So um, please do come for that. Um, all right. Thanks. Thanks so much, all of you. This was wonderful. As usual, the chat was super active. Lots of good stuff going on. Lots of information. I'm really looking forward to tucking into some spreadsheets this afternoon. And uh, yeah, that was great. So we'll see everybody again at 2 p.m. if you're coming back for the, the course uh welcome and logistics section and if not thank you so much for joining us really appreciate it the enrollment for for this grant is in the chat in numerous places if you wanted to take a moment to do that and uh, if not have a great rest of the conference and we'll see you around thanks everybody